I call this presentation the response of the papacy to the Reformation from the 16th century to the present time. And this is part two of what is in two parts. We saw in part one, and I'll give an overview, that the Counter-Reformation began in the 16th and 17th centuries. It began principally with the man, St. Ignatius of Loyola, called St. Ignatius of Loyola by the Catholic Church, who started the Jesuit order with the express purpose of bringing the Reformation nations back to Roman Catholicism, both as a civil power uh, when possible and as a religious system. His main tactics were to train and educate through excellence in education families across Europe and particularly families of importance like monarchs, princes and leading families so as to bring the Catholic Church back and they were very successful in influencing different monarchs. Usually if a territory had a king that was Catholic then the whole nation would return to Catholicism. It was the uh, policy at the time usually that a nation went with the same faith as their leaders. So the principal effort of Ignatius was then to bring back and it is really sad if you read histories like uh, Wiley of the um, history of Protestantism you will see again and again nations that were quite biblical coming back into the Catholic fold. He also used his book called Spiritual Exercises which was to teach people self-mastery and discipline and how to reach mystical uh, communion with God, something that he himself personally did. And uh, that has been lethal. It has been quoted even up to the present day by people like Tony Jones in the emerging church movement that is sweeping the United States and other nations, where by this mystical uh, um, union with God, or so-called mystical union with God, is still a major force of um, Catholicism and has been taken on by others. The uh, Jesuits then were quite successful right across Europe. In 1798 we saw that the Roman Church uh, looked like it had reached the end of being the, the Holy Roman Empire. They lost their civil base. They used to have the Vatican States. Now, uh, a general from Napoleon's army came and took uh, Pope Pius VI from his papal throne, and he no longer was a ruler of civil power. And this looked like a mortal wound to Romanism. Nonetheless, Rome that had risen out of the first Roman Empire, the political Roman Empire, knew that she had ambitions and she had power and glory in her mind and that she could rise out of this fall and she began to reorganize herself. The major one in reorganization and the ambitious one was Pope Pius IX. He made up his mind against the absurdness of, from a biblical point of view of a man being infallible, the Pope being infallible, and uh, against history, Catholic history, and even renowned Catholic historians knew that there had been, in, that there had been heretical popes throughout history. But um, nonetheless, he, he thought that he had to bring in this dogma of papal infallibility, which he did, at Vatican Council I in 1870. And then he set about re-centralizing the power 
of Catholicism by taking on to himself the authority to appoint bishops across Europe so that the bishops would be uh, more obedient to the Pope. Uh, this uh, idea and concept was further uh, advanced by his successor, Pius X, who came out with the first Code of Canon Law in 1917. This was to centralize Vatican power. So in these years, the Vatican was centralizing its power so that the Pope was becoming more and more a dictator within Catholicism to the rest of the Catholic world. And the um, Reformation that had succeeded across Europe had succeeded mightily in Britain. And... Um, the Anglicans with the 39 articles which were quite biblical, quite doctrines of grace and many really great believers in England uh, were standing strong. But a movement began and it was the result of a political move by which the uh, Parliament in England conceded and gave in to the Catholic Church to allow the Jesuits to return. It was called the Catholic Emancipation Act of 1829. And the Jesuits were allowed back. They had been expelled politically from England and they were allowed back in 1829. Then in 1833, a prelate of the um, Church of England, John Henry Newman, began what was called the Oxford Movement. Sometimes they're called the Tractarians because they produce many tracts. It was some, one of the first popularizing of sending out tracts. And they popularized what was going to be ritualism, bringing people back to rituals instead of the gospel and putting people's minds on the, a future Antichrist to come and taking their mind off what had always been the historical uh, um, interpretation of scripture from a, a biblical historical point of view of seeing the man of sin and the antichrist in the midst of the church as the reformers had and this has been quite successful it broke my heart during the last week on the 16th of June to get the news it was in all the major newspapers of England and it was on the internet right across the internet it was in a very famous Anglican church, uh, a ceremony took place. It took place in St. Bartholomew, the great ch Anglican church. And if you know anything about British history, St. Bartholomew the Great was a very famous church because right, it's in Smithfield, where many of the Anglicans and others had been burnt at the stake for biblical faith. A most historical place, people go there to honor men and women, some women too, who had died for their faith. There at St. Bartholomew the Great in London, 16th of June, they celebrated a marriage of two Anglican priests to each other, two men. A sodomite marriage was celebrated. Now it was not accidental that that's where they chose to have the the so-called ceremony, this blasphemous ceremony, and can we not but pray that God would show his wrath against such a blasphemous act in such an auspicious place. But that could be seen as some of the fruitfulness, the way of the Oxford movement. It has brought, brought Anglicanism back into ritualism, deadness, barrenness, and now utter depravity, showing and in the Anglican Church, it would really break your heart. But the Anglican Church has, for the most part, ceased. The this was this past week, the 16th of of June. Uh, it is um, it is sad that what the Oxford Movement was doing and trying to get people's mind on a future Antichrist was also propagated by others unintentionally. They did not know that they were doing what the Jesuits had set out to do. The famous Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, Francisco Ribera, back at Reformation times, 
were trying more and more to bring people back into or bring people to away from biblical faith and historical interpretation of the scriptures to a future antichrist and then later Manuel Lacunza with the same concept of a future antichrist to come so that people would not see Roman Catholicism as they had always seen even before the Reformation as the woman rides the beast Revelation 17 and 18 and 2 Thessalonians 2 the man of sin the son of perdition they would cease to see that now this was propagated by real good Bible believers John Nelson Darby who started the Plymouth Brethren he was a former Catholic himself he'd been saved out of Catholicism nonetheless he and his movement started to propagate this I have a copy of Manuel Kunz's book and when you read it it reads so much like what the brethren teach it's so much of it is similar Manuel Lukunza, the future coming of the Messiah in majesty and glory. And he signed himself as Ben Yosephat Ezra, born again Jew, which was a total lie. He was a Jesuit saying that he was a born again Jew. Now it looks like the brethren leaders study this south of Dublin, Powers Court Castle. They studied this and they were taken in by this and they thought this really was a born again Jew. And the brethren have propagated this idea of a future Antichrist to come. Other staunch believers have likewise done this. Lewis Berry Schaefer, who started Dallas Theological Seminary, took up the same concept of a future uh, Antichrist to come with his whole dispensational way of thinking. Quite similar also to Manuel Lukunza. It's really, really sad. I had given to Dave Hunt or asked Dave Hunt to read Manuel Lukunza and see how similar it was to what he had as somebody in the brethren, but of course he would not he would not read it. It is really sad to see to see this happening and this has influenced seminaries right across the United States and the Schofield Bible became like a primer to teach people about a future Antichrist and it's been taken up by such as Hal Lindsay and Tim LaHaye and it is the popular way of looking at the Antichrist in America not so much of course in Europe it has influenced Europe and other parts of the world but it has become the major um, uh, interpretation. It is really sad to see this because this has been a real tool that the Catholic Church has used and it has hidden behind uh, this sort of thing. It is uh, sad that the Catholic Church advanced also because not having the gospel it had to substitute something else and it brought in some major dogmas that have been highly successful from a devotional point of view in bringing people into a false works gospel and this is the, the official declaration of Mary being the Immaculate Conception that was done by Pius IX in 1854 and in 1950 the declaration of the uh, Assumption of Mary and Mary being Queen of Heaven by uh, Pius the Twelfth. These have been really sad because this is how Catholicism has lived, and people get into the works gospel big time. That souls will go to hell if you do not do penance for them, if you do not suffer. It was personally what drove me, in, in a certain way, to become a Catholic priest, and when why I would flagellate myself, take cold showers, and do horrendous penances was I was suffering that souls would not go to hell as a as a, um, a student preparing for the priesthood it is a driving force a satanical thing that you can save others by your suffering and um, it is full of signs and lying wonders in the states we have Denver Colorado Lubbock Texas and 
uh, Conyers Atlanta is the main apparition sites. There's others. And uh, we have Bosnia, Herzegovina, Lourdes in, in France and Fatima in Portugal and many others across the world of places where Mary has appeared as Queen of Heaven and to endorse the official Catholic teaching, the signs and lying wonders. So the Catholic Church has increased because of these things and it is their answer to the Reformation. We saw the historical turnaround that happened in the 20th century exactly on the 20, the, the, um, 1929, the Lateran Treaty, where Mussolini, the dictator, conceded to the Vatican, Vatican Hill and other territories. St. John Lateran's is the main church of the Pope, actually it's not St. Peter's, it's outside the Vatican, but territory outside what is Vatican Hill, but Vatican Hill is known principally as the Vatican. And the Vatican again became a civil power. Uh, the Vatican has increased its might and uh, um, effect on nations as a civil power. And uh, it was as a civil power that it reached out to Hitler, made a concordat with him like they did with Mussolini. And they were behind a lot that the Nazis did in the horrific World War II. Uh, they were, you know, part and parcel of what happened with Franco in the devastation of, of, of Spain, Salazar in Portugal, Juan Peron in Argentina, and on and on with dictators. They have been using their position as a civil power beside a religious power. And principally in the present day, they have ambassadors, including the United States of America because of President Reagan's decree in 1984, they have ambassadors to 174 nations and they try to bring in uh, Catholic law as part of civil law, sometimes more successful than others in some nations. They have not done that in the United States. It's only ambassadors. There's no concordat, but they're doing concordats with many, many nations. We now come to the uh, second part, and that is the um, of this response of the Catholic Church besides these things which were major and that's why I thought we had to give an overview we have the European Union the European Union is a tool of the Catholic Church it is their way of trying to bring in a united uh, states of Europe whereby things will be united of course they're mostly Catholic nations under the Pope and under uh, Catholic political thought and Catholic economic thought and Catholic way of doing things which is not uh, democratic and is not representational. Uh, it uh, really started with in 1946 Winston Churchill said we must build a kind of United States of Europe he was trying to have a European type of United States. That's what I was trying to say earlier on. That idea went back to Winston Churchill. It was not as Winston Churchill saw it, that there would be sovereign nations. The Catholic Church has seen it as nations joined in a federal union which has its own legislation. Uh, even the secular newspaper, The Telegraph, declared uh, that this was a serious thing. The Sunday Telegraph in August 1991 wrote the following about the European Union. It started under the inspiration of Catholic politicians such as Adenauer of Germany, Paul Henry Spack, Jean Monnet, Robert Schuller, the Charter on the Socialism of Jacques Delors, are imbued with Catholic social doctrine. If the European federalism triumphs, the European community will indeed be an empire, but it will lack an emperor, but it will have the Pope. It is not difficult to think that Wayatollah 
and it's the Pope himself realizes this. That is the secular newspaper showing you the Catholic influence behind the European Union. Now it's had difficulties. It already has, of course, a parliament in Brussels. It already has its own flag. It already, is, it already has its own currency. And it has already de declared laws. But its constitutional, its, its constitution has been questioned by many different nations and it has not yet been recognized. But it is a tool that the Catholic Church is using to try and bring Europe under its heel. The last Pope, John Paul II, wrote a, a whole uh, uh, encyclical or one of his um, teachings on the uh, Europe and the importance of having a common Europe and a united Europe. So this has been a... a a ploy of the Catholic Church and it looks as it's been successful. It is not all completely in position as yet. The Church of England has for the most part gone down as we saw it's become ritualistic and it has lost what was biblical faith. The Queen Elizabeth, the present reigning queen in England has really fallen from the faith. She really has ceased to be the protector of the faith. She no longer defends what part of her coronation oath, the biblical faith that she's supposed to be the head of. She actually has a Roman Catholic priest as an advisor. It is really sad that what had been so strong with the 39 articles and so many people giving their lives for biblical faith, for the most part has gone liberal and ecumenical and horrifically depraved as we saw with what happened last week. It is really heartbreaking. I had spoken at some of the Church of England continuing churches when I was there in uh, 2003 and it will break your heart to see how small they are and insignificant in human terms. Lord willing, Lynn and I will be going to uh, Scotland in October and we'll be going to churches of the, the Free Church of Scotland continuing. Scotland fell after England but it has been a similar story that the biblical faith so known from the time of John Knox and many others, Patrick Hamilton and others, in Scotland has gone by the wayside for the most part but um, so the papacy and its response has been successful in human terms the uh, Roman Empire the Holy Roman Empire ceased as we saw when they, they lost their military might and power but then they got it back in 1929 and they have, in the meantime, reorganized centrally and they have planned and they have prepared for a change of strategy. And it's most important to see this strategy because we live under it and it has been quite successful. And we have leading evangelicals who have embraced it. It was the strategy that took place at Vatican Council II no longer a dictatorship, no longer able to enforce her might and power as she did under the Inquisition by torture and burning at the stake for 605 years. She now has a tactic of false ecumenism. And this was rendered public in Vat at the Vatican from 1962 to 1965. And they changed their tactics completely. They didn't change their dogmas that change the way of approach. Heretics, as Bible believers used to be called, were no longer heretics. They now are separated brethren. And the Buddhism, Islam and Hinduism, which were pagan religions and condemned, are now recognized as ways of illumination that can lead us to God. Complete turnaround regarding paganism and a facade that the uh, heretics who are by believers are now separated 
brethren and they declared what was there to be their policy. I quote from document number 42, Reflections and Suggestions Concerning Ecumenical uh, Dialogue. And it was uh, published by the Vatican. Uh, it said, Dialogue is not an end in itself, nor just an academic discussion. Rather, it, 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 ecumenical dialogue, serves to transform modes of thought and behavior and daily life in those communities, that's non-Catholic churches. In this way, it aims at preparing the way for their unity of faith into the bosom of a church, one and visible. Thus, little by little, the obstacles to perfect ecclesial communion are overcome. All Christians will be gathered in a common celebration of the Eucharist into the unity of the one and only church which Christ bestowed on his church from the beginning. This unity, we believe, dwells in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose. And um, this is what the Catholic Church declared. And... Uh, it is a document that was published right across Europe in different languages. It was quite easy for leading evangelicals at the time, such as John Stott and J.I. Packer, to read these documents. They were public, they were well known. Uh, the decree on the Cumulus was, was published in 1964. It could be read in an hour or less. It's just 18 pages in length. It is really sad that such as Packer and John Stott not only did not take a warning that the Catholic Church is bringing people back into the bosom of our own self and our own ritualism. They did not study that and take heed from that. Rather, just after that, three years after that, they started a movement in, the, in England with the conservative Anglicans, whatever is still standing after Newman's assault, they start a movement that is going to evolve into a whole movement that is officially known as the Anglo-Roman Catholic International Commission, an agreement between Romanism and Anglicanism of acceptance of really Roman Catholic teachings and principles. Uh, it has been really sad. This was uh, done in incremental stages. It was first of all at Kiel in England in, in 1967 and then at Nottingham in England in 1977. So 67 and 77. The concept was that the new policy was to accept ritualistic Anglicans who were essentially Roman Catholic in practice. And uh, John Stott and J.I. Packer endorsed the statements of these conferences. John Stott, who was actually chaired the first conference at Kiel, made it clear that the conference was accepting not only uh, Anglo-Catholics who were ritualists and liberal but Roman Catholics as well. The Nottingham Conference put its seal of approval on what had happened at Kiel and it was further welcomed and approved of the charismatic movement. It is remembered for the statement of David Watson, a charismatic who stood up and said one of the greatest tragedies of history is the Reformation. It is really sad to see what happened in England. Uh, this was actually the plan of the Catholic Church under Cardinal Manning. You can study the Jesuits and Cardinal Manning. Their plan was to take England first of all and then to take the United States afterwards. And that's how it happened in actual fact. I remember talking to some of the believers in Slovakia and Hungary and Poland when I was there in the year 2000 and they were very conscious that once England went down 
the United States was went down afterwards and then they all would collapse there was nobody to look to it's, it's really sad that's how it happened and this is was 17 years later that the tidal wave of ecumenism false ecumenism hit the United States of America it was in 1994 and the, doc, the uh, document produced was Evangelicals and Catholics together it still has a huge devastating effect on churches in the United States and uh, it uh, was mainly the work of Charles Colson uh, of Breaking Point you know he's on the radio stations in most cities in the United States every single day in most cities and uh, he sends out a news uh, item most days by email is uh, Charles Colson and Richard John Newhouse, an apostate from Lutheranism who became a Catholic priest. And um, two Jesuits helped in the drafting of the, um, the drafting of the uh, document to, and with help from people like Richard Land, Larry Lewis of Southern Baptist, Jesse Miranda and some others. The evangelical signatories, besides J.I. Packer, the one who, who thoroughly endorsed it, was the late Bill Bright of Campus Crusade, Mark Knoll, famous historian of Wheaton, who is now teaches at a Catholic college. He's become Catholic himself. Pat Robertson, and figures like the late Cardinal John O'Connor of New York, Archbishop of Sevilla, uh, Archbishop Stafford, and Bishop... Uh, Francis George, who is now Archbishop of Chicago. This uh, 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 document has been lethal and has helped advance Romanism in leaps and bounds, as did the second document called The Gift of Salvation, published in Christianity Today with a cover note by the famous Timothy George. Timothy George should be well known to you. He is one of the founders of the Founders Movement. The Founders Movement was the movement inside the Southern Baptists to bring in and to hold to the traditional uh, doctrines of grace in the Southern Baptists. The Founders have for the most part, the Founders who have been loyal and their churches are very staunch and usually quite biblical. But Timothy George has been an apostate and acted as an apostate and a false teacher. And he has been the one who published a covering note on Evangelicals and Catholics Together too, called The Gift of Salvation. And uh, he has been on the rampage trying to propagate it and bring it into, uh, bring it into acceptance. I was speaking in Long Island one Sunday. Um, I was speaking at a conservative Baptist church, one of the few ones that hasn't gone down under uh, evangelicals and Catholics together. It, it has devastated that whole denomination, the conservative Baptists, for the most part, in giving in to evangelicals and Catholics together, have become a liberal church. It is really sad. I was speaking at one of the churches that... Uh, and they were asking me to give an outline. And then at their Sunday school, they were showing a DVD by Timothy George about the time of history of where the Inquisition took place. And he completely whitewashed Romanism. It's really sad. Professional DVDs made by this Timothy George, even to try and change history or to rewrite history. He has been successful in having a conference with John Armstrong to bring John Armstrong from his quite famous ministry, Reformation and Revival, to, if you go on the internet, put in uh, Reformation and Revival into a search engine, it comes up with Advancing Christian Tradition in the Third Millennium, his new name. He changed to Advancing Tradition from Reformation and Revival. He completely changed the stand. And he took on the philosophy of evangelicals and Catholics together. It has devastated mission fields in, in Spain, Portugal, uh, Africa, nations across the world whereby 
people often now do not send missionaries to Catholic countries because the Catholics are supposed to be uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. This has been the leading, I think, way in which the Catholic Church has now brought itself back into focus and be accepted as a Christian denomination. It is sad that while there are churches that have stood strong and have not wavered and have not been influenced, they have not spoken out against this. It's like they... Uh, will not give in to it, but they do not speak out against it. There's very little said against it. It was most of the churches that I used at the beginning of my ministry speak at. I used to speak at First Baptist Church, Community Baptist Church, Conservative Baptist Churches were the first churches I ever spoke at. Not only did the Conservative Baptists give in for the most part, but most of what had been called the Community Bible Churches and the ordinary Baptist churches have given in to evangelicals and Catholics together. It has not only been successful overseas, but it has devastated what had been biblical faith here in America. And uh, it, has, it has been really sad to see how all of this um, has happened. The... Um, J.I. Packer has not only endorsed Keel, Nottingham, and Evangelical Catholic 1 and 2, but he has written, he has written to try to justify why he has endorsed these things. The book called Common Mission, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, Common Mission, J.I. Packer wrote the following. Neither evangelicals nor Roman Catholics can stipulate the things they believe, which the other side does not believe, be made foundational to partnership at this point. So evangelicals and Catholics together, let's go off Protestant precision on the doctrine of justification and the correlation between conversion and new birth. That is in page 167. Now, uh, he gives his reason why you've got to let go of the precision. He speaks about the need to cooperate and work together because of the evils of humanism, materialism, hedonism, and nihilism. And he states his proposal in the following, that the domestic differences about salvation in the church should not hinder us from joint action in seeking to re-evangelize the North American milieu. The famous J.I. Packer is now calling justification by faith alone a domestic issue and it should not hinder us from seeking to jointly work with the Catholics and others to re-evangelize. How can you re-evangelize with a false gospel? You cannot. But this is really sad and so few have ever even removed J.I. Packer from the bookshelves or said one word because he's so famous. It is really sad to see how Bible-believing churches have not said anything while the other side is continuing to voice its joining together with Romanism. And this has been quite, quite horrendous. Packer is only one of many who tried to defend uh, evangelicals and Catholics together in that book called The Common Mission. A real turning point and a heartbreaking day was the 31st of October 1999. It's, also, it's known, of course, it's the day when Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the door in Wittenberg, the 31st. It is often, uh, for those who do not celebrate Halloween, it's Reformation Day is what people celebrate. But on that day, the exact date, 1999, the Catholic Church, together with the Lutheran World Federation, published a, doc a, a document called the Joint Declaration uh, 
on the doctrine of justification. The Catholic Church has been successful to declare its dogma as official now with the Lutherans. And they did it after 30 years of so-called dialogue, little by little, as they say in their document. They have brought the Lutherans to accept Catholic terminology. And so in this document, we have justification to be said to be conferred, that is, it's given through sacraments, rather than credited or imputed, the word that Paul uses and is used in Scripture for justification is credited to the believer. No, it is conveyed or it is conferred, the Catholic Church says. So this um, has been a real horrendous turnaround that has happened in the response to the Reformation in 1999. The document declares that a consensus in basic truths on the doctrine of justification exists between Lutherans and Catholics and that the mutual condemnations of former times do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification as they are presented in the joint declaration. The mutual condemnations do not apply. Of course, they do not apply because it is Roman Catholic dogma that is declared in the declaration. But God's wrath against the false gospel still applies. God still hates those who teach a works gospel or a gospel by ritualism. But the Catholic Church still has in its books its condemnation of true Bible believers. The sixth session of the Council of Trent, it declared the following, and this is still official Roman Catholic teaching. And they call the Council of Trent an infallible council. Their official word. If anyone shall say that by faith alone that a sinner is justified, or so that as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification and that in no way is it necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. You are eternally cursed in the eyes of Rome if you believe that a man or a woman is justified by faith alone. And uh, the Catholic Church has declared this. This uh, quite famous uh, statement took place on the 31st of October. And it's, um, it's amazing that the Lutherans, for the most part, not all Lutherans, some of the Missouri Synod here in the United States would not accept this decree, but many, many of the Lutherans have, and it continues. Quite recently, the Methodist Church have signed on to this Catholic Lutheran decree, and they say they accept what is in the decree. So it has brought down a lot of remaining Methodists as well, even though it wasn't intended for that. But this is a very key point that Martin Luther had stood strong at the time of the Reformation. And it, the Catholic Church thinks in terms of centuries and not just a few years. It is interesting that this joint declaration took place on the exact 482nd anniversary of Martin Luther posting his theses on the Wittenberg door. 482 years later. And it's significant that the Catholic Church chose Augsburg, Germany, where they published this decree. Catholic Church is very conscious of place and dates. Augsburg, Germany was a famous place because it was there in 1555 that the Peace of Passau was enacted, that the papacy would no longer accomplish by war and inquisition, would no longer would no longer ban other religions. Peace was to between the Catholic Church, a, a 
biblical faith or Lutheran faith could exist in these church in, in across these nations that from the peace of Paso. What the Catholic Church has not been able to produce otherwise, they have now by multi faceted deception produced in this document. Lutherans and Catholics accepting false message of justification and bringing it in on a horrendous date or a horrendously significant date and at, at Augsburg, Germany, the very place where uh, peace had been recognized and acceptance of other religions besides Romanism had been recognized formally in 1555. There have been other major advances of, of Romanism and it's, it's hard to give a summary because they're so lethal and they're so profuse and it's so, it, it's been so, uh, uh, so effective that it is, um, it is really hard to give a summary. We have what's called a new perspective. Uh, it's a new perspective on justification. Uh, and it has devastated many of the reformed Presbyterian churches. I used to consistently for many years, like five years in a row, speak at a conference with the uh, PCA churches. And of course I'm not asked any longer because many of them have been affected by this. Many of the uh, Presbyterian churches, not all, and in particular the free Presbyterians have in no way been touched and they actually speak against the new perspective. But it has engulfed, its roots go back really to, to Europe, but from in America we see some of its beginnings, particularly in 1997 with Professor Norman Shepherd of Westminster, uh, theological seminary. Shepherd was not only one faculty member, other faculty members supported him and even the board of trustees uh, s supported him. And uh, for many years men were trained in this so-called new perspective that really is a completely unbiblical idea of union with the covenant to bring a person into justification rather than justification by faith alone as we have always seen scripturally or as we should have seen scripturally. An offshoot of this is what called the Auburn Theology uh, movement. Uh, it's quite similar in a way that it's heading towards Romanism and it has very well known pastors such as Doug Wilson, Steve Wilkins, Steve Schischel. Quite well known and many, many books have been written by these men. This holds, of course, a false view of justification and it holds for baptismal regeneration that when you are baptized, uh, you are regenerate or you're supposed to be brought into the covenant so infants can become Christian through being baptized. And it is thoroughly wicked and it has been highly successful. It has influenced also the homeschool movement because Doug Wilson particularly was very big in the homeschool movement. And so many uh, Bible-believing homes have been influenced uh, by the Auburn theology as it comes into teachings of, from the homeschool movement across the United States. That is just a quick overview. It is really hard to, to give any type of insight into a, a profuse and very effective movement in the new perspective of the Auburn theology. There have been other huge movements, uh, Christian churches together has been quite successful, it's very like ECT, they call about historical churches including the Catholic Church and other churches working together and we have the Coming Home Network in many, many cities on television and in, on the internet it is huge, we have the Coming Home Network its stated purpose, quoting from its webpage, is to provide fellowship, encouragement and support for pastors and laymen of other traditions, Protestant, Orthodox, etc., who are somewhere along the journey or have already converted to the Catholic Church. They celebrate uh, uh, Protestant pastors and leaders and lay people who have become Roman Catholic who were Protestant before. 
and they're quite focal and they're quite uh, adamantly on the war path with conferences, DVDs and uh, production of materials. They have produced a book called Surprised by Truth, The Testimonies of Protestants Who Have Become Catholic. And so it's, a, it's a, actually it's in two volumes and uh, many other things. Uh, we have... Um, we have famous people in that, such as Scott Hahn, uh, Jeff Cavins, Marcus Grody as the leader of, well, of it to a great extent, Jerry Matadix and many others. Most of these were former Presbyterian pastors who have become Roman Catholic. We also have another movement that has um, devastated many churches. It usually happens that a assistant pastor, a youth pastor becomes part of the emerging church movement. The emerging church movement has swept the United States, gone into France, Europe, is slowly making its way into England and many other nations of the world. I got a letter from Malawi, from a pastor in Malawi of all places, asking me, could I explain more about the emerging church movement as it was affecting churches in Malawi? You know, you know, so it's gone into Africa and of course India and other places too. The emerging church movement has Brian McLaren as his, one of its main leaders, Tony Jones and Alan Jones of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. It markets Roman Catholic mystical ideas and it does so in very effective ways and it's very modern the conferences they have organized by Zondervan for pastors every year, usually on the West Coast, you know, is highly publicized on the Internet. The DVDs they produce are quite attractive, beautifully professionally done, and showing people how to do labyrinths, how to use the uh, spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, how to enter into communion with God. And, uh, of course, people will give their testimonies how their life has been changed as they have been touched by God. It is, uh, it is a real sad thing to see how this has devastated uh, America and many other nations of the world. There is, of course, one mediator between God and man, and we do not have any direct communion with God. And the whole idea of communion with God outside of Jesus Christ or by a person's own imagination or use of different methods uh, is totally abhorrent. On our webpage we have four articles that I have done on the emerging church and we have many others, particularly by Ken Silva. The Catholic Church has increased also and this is quite quite devastating and it continues to have huge effects by its ecumenical by its ecumenical work but by its political and economic policies the present Pope has endorsed uh, what previous Popes have said and in particularly John Paul II that there is no such thing as private property that uh, Private property does not exist as such, but it belongs to all people. Quoting from the previous Pope, his, uh, the, the um, John Paul II, the present Pope said, private property in fact is under a social mortgage, which means that it has an intrinsically social function based upon and justified by the principle of the universal destination of goods. The universal destination of goods means that goods belong to everybody in fact. And uh, there is a universal ownership of goods. The Vatican has on its webpage a famous uh, document, Gaudium et Spes, and where they say the following. This is direct quotation. If one is in extreme necessity, he has a right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. If one is in extreme necessity, he, he has a right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. That is a justification of theft. You can steal if you have extreme need. 
I don't have time, but if you go into the document, you see that the Robin Hood principle, that if you see somebody else in need, you can steal for them, is also justified in that dogma. So the Catholic Church is insisting on its, uh, its economic policy, and this has devastated the nations of the world. Look at the South American countries that have had Catholic economic policies and see how destitute they are. See what it did in the course of history. But now they are publicizing the, uh, these things. Economic Justice for All 1995, the U.S. bishops said, in Catholic teaching human rights include not only civil and political rights, but also economical rights. All people have a right to life, food, clothing, shelter, rest, medical care, education, and employment. And so the Catholic Church sees a universal destination of goods, and they see that goods are to be shared by all. This is a quite um, popular social teaching, uh, economic, social economic teaching, and then you know it, 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 it would fit in with Barack Obama and his ideas, and it would be lethal to the American economy. But the Catholic teaching on economics is devastating, and it is quite popular. And we see how many congressmen and women and senators who are Catholic in the United States, it makes it frightening who accept Catholic economic policies. And so this is the way in which the Catholic Church has increased. We give our reply that we see that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about many would come, other Christ claiming to be the Christ, that the Apostle Peter said there were many false teachers, and so did the Apostle Paul warned about many would fall away. But we've seen it particularly since the Reformation. And we see the horrendous movement that has taken place and the devastation it has had. And we see evangelicals joining hands in the dark with the Church of Rome and calling them as Timothy George does and now uh, John Armstrong and others, Pat Robinson, brothers and sisters in Christ. We see that these things have happened before our eyes and it's for us to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints and to know that we are people who have to contend for the faith whether they hear us or not. We stand in times of great declension and apostasy, but it is for us to declare God's truth and to do so knowing that he is sovereign. All the baying hounds of hell cannot bring down the gospel. All the evil efforts of false ecumenism and false alliances cannot come against the sovereign God. He stands strong. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. It's for us, like the Apostle Paul, to strong, st stand strong in face of all opposition and to give the gospel of grace that the Lord's own sheep will be brought in, the true citizens of the kingdom, and that he will be praised forevermore. Amen and amen. Praise God. Our God reigns. Hallelujah. Yes, the question is that do, do we not believe that there are true Christians in these organizations? Yes, there can be true Christians in these organizations, even in the Catholic Church, but they come out from and be separate. It, you cannot stay in a system that consistently denies. You cannot stay in, inside the Catholic Church with its sacramentalism and its denying uh, of biblical faith. It's praying to others besides God, praying to Mary and the saints. You cannot stay in an Anglicanism that denies biblical faith, that performs such marriages as we saw during the week. You cannot stay inside a community like that. You've got to leave. So if you are a true Christian inside of these communities, you leave. You separate and you come out. And 
that's what it says in Revelation, be not come out from her, my people, and be, and, and be not partakers of her sins. So we leave these, uh, these things and uh, we come out. i just like to say a word of um, uh, what's so much on my heart is this evening I'm really giving the, the answer to all the apostasy in the message that Pastor Jackson has allowed me to give on biblical revival in time of apostasy. And that is so much on my heart. I'm uh